I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to start first by sort of introducing myself and sort of the, the concept of what we're going to be talking about today, because it's kind of an interesting uh, approach uh, that, that I came into, into kind of uh, kind of K-12 science. And so my background is I'm a neuroscientist, an electrophysiologist, and I spent um, far too long, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you how long I was in school for, to get my PhD, uh, and just to get access uh, to the equipment to understand how the brain works. And that's what I'm really written, what I was trying to get at was trying to understand the nervous system about, about how our brains do the things that they do. And I think that's uh, a pretty common question that most uh, people have and a lot of students have as well. I noticed that uh, when I was in graduate school, I would go into the classrooms and talk to them and then uh, we would be bombarded with questions, um, uh, as you can imagine, about, about dreams, about, about you know, memories, uh, about motor actions and, and, and uh, you know, motor learning and practice and stuff. So there's a, a lot of uh, thirst for knowledge out there, but there hasn't been really anything that you could do in, in, uh, in schools uh, except for you could study long enough and get your Ph.D. and, you know, one day get access to these expensive tools. And so, uh, and when thinking about this for a while, it, realized that it was, it's, a, it's a bit of a shame, really, because 20% uh, of the world, that's one out of five people have a neurological disorder, and how many cures do we have for neuroscience diseases? Zero. We have not one cure, but we're, we have, you know, a huge problem with uh, neural afflictions. And so why aren't we teaching neuroscience in, in K-12 uh, to, the, to the point of uh, which we could? It's because it's perceived as being too difficult, and, and uh, the equipment that I, I talked about earlier that I use in grad school costs about forty thousand dollars. So, not quite uh, something that you could possibly do in, in, the, in the classroom. So that's when uh, my co-founder and I were in the lab, and we decided to look at other areas of science. For example, in astronomy, uh, these, these telescopes that we use are really expensive, but they have kind of cheap alternative kind of DIY telescopes that you can purchase from, you know, like the Walmart or. or Store, and you're able to collect data just like the the, the big guys, right? The big science, um, and maybe you become inspired to become a you know a scientist in general, or specifically into into astronomy or uh, cosmology. So, uh, but the point was, you didn't have to you know dedicate your entire life to get access to the tools to understand about how the planets move. You could do that for how the cheap, and so. Um, Around this time is when we started thinking about could we do something like that for, for K through 12 in neuroscience. So we started going out and approaching schools and, and talking to them about um, about the brain. We had different things we would do to sort of show you analogies about how the brain works. Um, and so some classic ones are the uh, we had a paper mache Frankenstein where a student would scoop out a part of the ice cream brain and then we would transfer that lesion. That's what we do as neuroscientists. We create lesions in animals. And we see what happens to the behaviors, and then we understand, aha, that part of the brain did this behavior, right? So this is a, a rich history over 80 years of people doing this in neuroscience. So we were doing this with ice cream, and we would transfer the lesion, for example, for the motor cortex over to the student. Um, and then if you scoop that out, then also the student, we would tie down their hands, they could move their arms. And so this is all kind of fun activities, and the kids like eating the ice cream. Uh, but what we found is that... Uh, it didn't really teach that much about what we were doing in the everyday lab. In the everyday lab, we're doing this really awesome experiment, recording from neurons, trying to understand the behaviors, understanding a little bit more about how the brain really works. And this is kind of getting at uh, some level of that, but it's mostly uh, not. I think most, for the most part, it wasn't quite getting at that, you know, that project-based learning that we were really trying to do, trying to get down to uh, having the students develop their own hypotheses and, and sort of explore uh, through neuroscience to understand about more about biological systems. So uh, that's what we decided that we wanted to uh, create our own version of our, our lab kit. This is a, a, a poster that we presented at the Society for Neuroscience, the largest neuroscience conference in the world, about 40,000 neuroscientists gathered, uh, and we demonstrated what we call the $100 spike. Uh, a spike is a term for what we neuroscientists call an action potential. It's a, it's a colloquial term. It's a term of endearment. Um, and, we, and the goal was uh, we were going to try to work for the entire summer. Uh, we submit the abstract in March, and we had to wait all the way until uh, October uh, to present these, these findings. And we said, you know, we're going to try on a budget of $100 to be able to record from a single neuron. Um, come back in October and see how we did. So if you did stop by our booth, uh, but have seen a much younger version of Tim and I uh, standing in front of a bunch of equipment, uh, which actually worked. We were able to 
to reproduce what our lab equipment did for stuff that we bought from Radio Shack and from a lumber store uh, to be able to record the actual potentials of living uh, uh, animals. So uh, we were pretty proud of this, and we just kind of displayed that there, thinking that was the end of the project, right? We, we, we did it. We got to move on. But then uh, it kind of caught on. Uh, our friends and colleagues first uh, wanted to, uh, I think because we had the $100 in the title, they thought they could just pull off their credit card and buy it. Uh, so we had a couple of people, and we built some for our friends, and then we realized that, that there could be, because of this initial problem, there could be a larger market for that. So uh, we ended up forming a, uh, a company called Backyard Grains, uh, and that company is in existence till today. And our goal is to create, uh, very similar to, the, to that first microbox, replacements of high-tech laboratory equipment that you would find at leading research universities around the world uh, but make them accessible for kids in uh, right around like fourth and fifth grade is when we start uh, to engage. And, and maybe with our students stuff, we can go a bit earlier. Uh, but for right now, we're, we're comfortable in that area. They know a little bit about cells. They know a little bit about electricity. Uh, and those are the two main concepts that have to be in place before we can start to talk about neurons and how do the neuroimpulses work. So uh, with that, I'm going to... Um, Talk about this is the invention on the far left, so this is the iteration process that goes through uh, the refinement from going from what uh, you can purchase today, uh, uh, work science, versus what we had at the original ones. We went through a bunch of refinements and we came up with a version that we think is simple enough that uh, a student in fourth or fifth grade can actually do their own recording throw from neurons, living neurons, uh, in the classroom. So. What I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to do a bunch of demos, uh, not just of this particular prep, but a bunch of preps that dive into the essence of who we are as a person, right? So like the, uh, all your personality quirks, the memories of, uh, you know, where were you, uh, the smell of your grandmother's basement. These are all very personal things, but they're actually encoded by something in your brain uh, that's called neurons. And so that's what um, our inventions tend to do is they tend to bring to light uh, things that were hidden uh, from from most of the general public, uh, but uh, in, in, a, in a kind of interesting and entertaining way uh, that allows them to ask very sort of uh, deep questions about, about the brain. So that's the goal. And I think before I dive into that, I'm going to just back up for a second. I'm not sure how much you guys know about the, the brain. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of biologists on here. This is, this is a bit snoozer for, but Bear with me, but it's also it's good to have a little bit of a, re, uh, a refresher. Uh, so these are neurons. Uh, neurons, by law, have to go from left to right on the, on the textbook. Uh, <laughs> the, um, so it's a, it's a cell body that has uh, a number of processes. A process is a special name that we use, just in something that stretches away from the body. And so uh, a lot of these processes are, are what's called inputs uh, to, to the neuron, and we call those dendrites. And there's a very specialized process, it's called the axon, and that stretches all the way out uh, to another, another cell. Uh, uh, out to a muscle fiber, it could be out to uh, a vein to put some chemicals in there, or it could be out to another neuron. So the axon could be uh, connecting, mostly uh, connect to other cells, multiple cells. So uh, what we're going to look at is how does this information pass from one cell to the other, and that's that's where it gets interesting. So that um, if you may remember from your uh, biology that this is done through electricity. Um, and you could ask you why is it electrical? You know, uh, I mean, certain things don't need. I mean, obviously, don't need uh, electricity for everything. Um, but electricity is fast. About uh, why why is the brain electrical? Because I could send a message to you chemically. Um, so, for example, if I always say, if, if the teacher is saying something I don't like it, I could fart, and then slowly they would realize that, that I'm not, that I don't like what they're saying, right? And then, or I could just, you know, turn off the lights. So, the idea is that a chemical message is super slow, and you'll die. You can't get out of the train quick enough if you just, like, you know, like, I need to get out of the way, and this slowly comes up there, and then you move. So, for example, things that move tend to have brain. So, things that, uh, you know, cats and dogs, that would be a brain. If you ask a student if an insect has a brain, they actually will say yes most of the time. Um, but if you ask them if a plant has a brain, they'll say no. Because plants don't just have the living, but they don't have brain. That's absolutely correct, 100% correct. So, plants do move, they do follow the sun, 
up, but they do that slowly. So the things that quickly need electricity, if that's why we have the nervous system evolved. That's right. So, uh, so we're going to look at how the actual axon will send these um, these messages, and the messages come in what uh, we lovingly call spikes. Uh, these are the action potentials or potential the axiom by the uh, discoverer of that uh, that particular event. So the this is what it looks like. It goes it's a spike, a railroad spike is where God's name. It goes sharp up, down, and up. And these are uh, an electrical recording. So I'm looking at time on the axis here, uh, and then the voltage is going up, down, and up. So this is a voltage measured from an electrode inside the brain. If I were to stick an electrode inside of your brain, drill the hole, put two wires in there, hook it up to an amplifier, this is what I would look at and see the spike shape down here. And um, how is this spike generated? That's another interesting question. Uh, and so that's done by making a battery out of cells. And you do that by pushing charged particles on one side. And you have a, a semi-permeable membrane there that keeps uh, sodium on one side and potassium on the other side. It takes some energy to flip those around and push them against their, their chemical gradient. And that's called our, our resting potential. So that's when you're sitting there sleeping. You're still burning a lot of energy, but you're still making those, those ions fluctuate in the other direction. So this causes work, but it allows you to have this potential energy that allows you to turn it into these spikes uh, that you know, will occur. So I don't go, when I talk to students, I don't go into too much details about this because we can't measure at the ion level uh, too much. And so I like to look at the, the phenomenology of this, and that's what we're going to do right now. Uh, we're going to do that uh, by sort of redoing an experiment that was first done in 1928 uh, by Sir Lord Adrian, and that is to record the action potentials, living action potentials of, uh, of an animal. So uh, to do that, I normally involve students, and I'll have um, uh, them sort of do everything, and I'm just sitting there watching the business. What I, what I love about what we do is that it's so simple that, um, that anyone can do this. So I'm going to show you now how we actually do it. The first thing we're going to do we're going to introduce you to our model organism that we have here in our uh, baby container. Uh, and so I'm going to try to get this camera to work. And we practice this so I can do this. Uh, here we go. So inside of here I have a, a my, my to-go terrarium. And you'll see that I have a number of little dudes in here. These guys are La Cucaracha. These are South American cockroaches. Uh, turn a little light on so they can get some get their moment of glory. So these guys, I like to use them. Uh, you can basically use any insect in the world. Uh, I like the cockroaches because, number one, kids have a visceral response, so they're all of a sudden immediately interested in what you're saying <laughs> when you do this. Uh, but the other reason why is that these particular ones are super slow. Uh, so unlike the insect that we have here in Michigan, uh, which are fast, like the dramatic cockroaches. These guys are slow, so if they escape, they're not going to catch them. Um, they also can't climb up glass, which is nice, and so you can be able to put lids on your terrariums. Uh, so there's another reason why they just eat lettuce, so they're nice to carry around the classroom. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull this guy out. Uh, I'm going to let his cousin go back in there. So I'm going to right here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to anesthetize him. All right, so um, I'm going to knock this guy out into some ice water here. So I'm going to anesthetize him in some ice water. I'm going to go back to that in just one second. And then while we're watching that guy, I was gonna, um, I'll keep that camera on him. I can bring the, the lens in a little bit closer. Actually, actually, Greg, we have a question through the chat. chat yeah, list. sure. So uh, it says here, Greg, you've got me thinking about insects and ethics in the classroom. Yeah. Can you That's chat true. about that a little bit? Yeah, I will. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about this right now. So the, um, this. This is interesting because this, this brings up, I'm going to go back to my other camera real quick. Um, so it's really important to talk about ethics in the classroom. And so uh, when we do any experiment class, it's important not only for schools, but just for life in general, I think, uh, about the use of animals um, in research, use of animals in education. And so uh, when we do any type of experiment, we have to ask the question of the, the, the cost-benefit ratio. And so uh, the question I would have for this one is, what is the cost to the insect? And I'm going to jump ahead in a few slides here. Um, I have no name for my slides. I have one. See, none of my slides have a... Uh... Well, I'm going to get to that in just one second. Let me explain this really quick. Why, why do we use the cockroach? Uh, 
we use it because it has the exact same neurons of our body. So this is a what's called an animal prep. Uh, so it's, it's a, a preparation that can be used as a, as a learning model for how the human brain works. And so this is an example of how the human brain has this spinal cord about a half a billion years ago, 500 million years ago, we evolved to have a brain area and a spinal cord area. So you can see that's conserved even in the cockroach. And so if you look at the, if you just slice of the cockroach brain and a slice of the human brain, uh, and you stained it, you looked at it under a microscope, would you be able to tell the difference if it was a cockroach or if it was a human? Probably not, right? So uh, I'm sure there are experts out there that could. When I look at them, I don't know what it is. Uh, they look, the, the size of the cells are relatively the same. The types of cells are relatively the same. What's different is that we have a huge area of the brain called the cortex, which is not in, uh, in, in many animals. All right. Uh, pass that one right now. There's a, so this is where I wanted to get to. So this is the cost now to the animal. So the what we're going to do is we're going to anesthetize the cockroach and we're going to cut off one of its legs so we can record the neurons that are inside that leg. Uh, and so we have to have a discussion about uh, about now we're going to be using an animal uh, and we're going to be injuring it, right? And so uh, we have to we have to be able to benefit, have some benefit that, that sort of offsets that and maybe you can weigh them out. So I'm going to tell you what the cost is first. Uh, so this is a, a paper that we published last year in, uh, in PLOS One, the scientific journal. And in this one, we had cut off a leg uh, and we let the other leg be the control leg. So we have within animal control, so you can see the left and right side. And what you'll notice is that 43 days after we cut off the leg, uh, on average, the bolt will occur and we'll get another leg that, that shows up. And if we jump ahead one more time uh, to 125 days later, now you can't tell the difference between the control leg and the one that we cut off. And so uh, what does that mean? That means that, number one, that the animal is kind of designed to rip their legs off. Uh, and so they have mechanisms in place that allow that leg to regrow. Um, so it's, it's easy for us to put our own uh, emotions into an animal, but we have to remember that we are not that animal. Uh, and so this is, uh, do we know if they feel pain? I don't think so, uh, but I don't know that for a fact. And so we anesthetize our animals just to be sure. Uh, but so the, the cost of the animal is that it will be without a leg for about 45 days and without a full leg for about 125 days. Uh, but from everything that we can measure, and we have it, is that they seem to eat the same amount, they seem to have sex the same amount, and they would act uh, even, without, even with a missing leg. So we don't think the cost is too high to the cockroach, given the fact that it has built-in mechanisms to sort of regrow these limbs. Uh, but what is the benefit to society to getting access to being able to manipulate neurons and really understanding about kind of these deep structures of the brain without having to drill into a human uh, or, or work on computer models which are not very accurate about what can actually happen in the real world? So I think it's, it's a, uh, an important discussion to have. And when I have had these with ethicists, and we do have ethicists uh, that we work with, and we have an ethics statement, and we also have a what's called an IRB, IRB, which is a uh, institutional review board that goes over all our procedures and makes sure that we are up to code on the ethics of what we do. So, thank you for asking that question. It's an important one, and uh, uh, it's an important one to even have for quite an extensive period of time. And I ask people while we're doing this, who's not feeling comfortable about that, and having discussed each, each part of the phase has uh, uh, a reason why why we do it, but there's a, uh, that's the other question. So why we even cut off a leg to begin with? Because we're going to talk about now what's happening with this cockroach, and that sort of starts, you know, students sort of thinking about what's really going on in, in this prep. So I'm going to go back to this other camera here. So he's been in there for, I don't know, maybe two or three minutes. Um, and this is the guy that just ran under my table and I had to rest, so catch him again. Um, and now he seems completely different, right? So now he seems like he's completely gone and he's just chilling there. And so the question now becomes, how, how is this change occurring, right? So what's happening inside the brain of this cockroach to make him no longer move? Um, and so we can go back and think about the, uh, the discussion we had about the ion channels opening and closing to cause these spikes. Uh, the ion cells have to literally open and close. So this is a, these are kinematic changes that are occurring, right? So this, what happens when things get colder? Things slow down, and when things slow down, um, things, right? so there's a kinematic change, therefore the 
I have channels. Don't open the way they used to. If you don't open the way you used to, you don't walk through fire spikes. If you don't fire spikes and you don't uh, move, so this guy can't move anymore. But we also uh, have stopped the message of pain going back up to the brain if there was pain there. So that's, uh, that's what we do to sort of um, help with it. And that's if you read the, the uh, scientific literature, when you're working with in invertebrates like this, this is the common method that's used. Um, and so that's what we use, and then we, we teach our students not only how to do it, but why to do it, right? We want to make sure that we can allow uh, to survive again. Uh, when it's, uh... any, more, is that, any more questions about that or anything else? So, so what you're going to see today uh, in a, in a uh, four-hour session, I mean, there's, there is so much about the brain that we can discover. But what's nice about what we're trying to do is we're trying to package these around experiment groups. Right? Each product that we're going to show you. So depending on how in depth you want to go, uh, you'll be able to, do, in two years' time, be able to do a full semester course uh, on neuroscience. So we're getting there. Uh, we're, we're, we just received a grant from the NIH to actually build that out. So we're excited about that. So we uh, are going to do based wrap around the NGSS. We're going to make project-based learning. So we say the things that we're showing you uh, to let the kids explore some driving questions to understand how the brain works. So we're super excited. All right. All right. Hi, Greg. We have one question. Can you sure. do the same experiment with crickets? They're much easier to come by. Yeah, we can. So the uh, we can do crickets. And actually, we published a paper. I'll, I'll post the link and see if I can find it. Um, we have published a paper on using crickets for this exact reason. So this goes into detail about uh, about all the experiments. You can do a bunch of experiments with, with these. Um, I'm going to show you one today, but in that paper, we reference a whole bunch of other ones that we need to do. So like neuropharmacology, you are interested in that. you're interested in, in uh, microstimulation, you can do that. And so this is, this is the most simple prep that we can do to really show the one I'm going to I'm going to jump back into the, to our phone here, and I'm going to show you what we're going to do. We're going to... Uh, Move one of his legs, and the reason why is we want to be able to record the neurons that are inside the arm of the cockroach and it goes back to the brain. So these are the, the sensory cells that are encoding touch information and wind information, the things that make cockroaches run away uh, when you open the door. Uh, those are the cells that we are So if I have a, here a schematic of this is the air, the long. We cause spikes to occur. They're going to be able to report it uh, from the, uh, from the uh, axons that are coming here up to the brain. We're going to be able to intercept that and be able to uh, record that. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back over to my camera here. And I'll show you a little bit how this works. And so, get my guy out here. What we have the students do is. I just take this is the gross part. Uh, and I don't have to do this either, but it'll be a little dip on the, on the leg of the cottage. Does anyone know why we're doing this? Uh, we're doing this to be the leg can warm back up. But we really want the, the temperature to increase in this leg so that the neurons will start firing again. And when they start firing again, they'll start to be able to produce these X potentials. And we should be able to record those X potentials from this. You can see, even on this. Like these little parts of hair that are there. And in there uh, are our neurons, and those neurons are coming up to this, to this part of the brain right here. So the, even though we cut it off, but normally this would, this would be this, uh, the ventral nerve cord or what's our spinal cord. So the information normally goes up there to the brain. But what's happening here is that even though it's detached from the, uh, from the body, these neurons are still alive. If I cut your leg off, you'd be dead. But if I cut this guy's off, off he's still alive. And one of the interesting things that we uh, found out, I didn't know about this until I started doing this research, is that when you, um, if I cut off your arm and leg, cut off your leg, it lasts Why it's minutes? Because why? You need to breathe, right? So this, this cockroach has what's called spherical. They have little holes all across their body that allows oxygen, carbon dioxide, to exchange kind of freely. And so when we cut the leg off, it's still that spherical is open, and so he's able to breathe just fine, and it's not better. Uh, so those neurons can keep the oxygen, so they're going to stay alive uh, for as long as you're doing the experiment. Our, our, actually, our record is about two days. Um, maybe a little bit more after we've done that experiment. So this recording from a one.
one cockroach leg and just leaving it sit there. If you put some fat, the problem is it dries out. So I, I, for a four hour session, eight hour session would be just fine. Uh, Greg, we also had uh, another question come through the chat. And uh, uh, the question is, are there any, um, can we use any invertebrates? Um, oh, any, yeah. Any, 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 any other invertebrates? Yep. Yeah, so we, we have a, uh, we have a, on our website, we have a, uh, a catalog of all the invertebrates we record from from here. But yeah, pretty much any invertebrate, including uh, a, the, the, you know, the king, right? So we've done uh, spiker box recordings on, on octopus, the, the largest brain of the invertebrate uh, world. And so uh, we've recorded from squid as well. So these, these are the squishy kinds of invertebrates. But, uh, so those work. Um, and so I think even in this presentation, I show you a few more insects that we've worked with that are interesting. So this summer we did a project with dragonflies. Um, we just published a paper this year on uh, grasshoppers. Uh, so we uh, work with fruit flies. We've worked with blowflies. We've uh, cockroaches, crickets. Um, yeah, you name it. So if if it and it's funny because like uh, my wife is Serbian and. and I had to give a talk over there once in the middle of winter, and uh, you can't find a cricket or, or a cockroach. So I just went outside, and even in the like this, in the cold, they don't get as cold as they do here in Michigan, but it was still kind of cold. I found a little tiny little bug moving around, and I just grabbed him and went in and gave a talk. And just put, I don't even know what that bug was. So anyway, uh, the answer is if it's invertebrate, it's you'll be able to record from the nervous system because. Uh, most of what the invertebrates are are shells around the nervous system, right? So you've got muscles and you've got, you've got your digestive system, you've got your junk here, but all of your extremities, all your arms and legs are nothing but your, your both those fire action potentials, so those are good. So, um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, that, that is beautiful. So the, then it becomes, what, what, what do you want to do? What question do you want to ask? And so what, and when I mentioned these different animals, I do so because each animal has its own unique thing. So, for example, in uh, you know, the cricket, you may be interested in, in what can it hear uh, and why does it hear that. So you may you can do some recordings and play different sounds, and you hear that they can hear other crickets around the one to two kilohertz tripping sounds. And then if you keep going up in frequency, all of a sudden they can't hear anymore. So now you know what they can hear. All right, so that's kind of interesting. But then the interesting thing is, you know, the students, if you keep turning up the frequency so high that you can't hear it, all of a sudden the cricket can hear it again because you can see the spikes coming in, guys. So you, you, then you ask, well, why would it hear something so high frequency that even the human ear can't hear it? Um, and it turns out the answer is with bats. So they can sit there and listen with their arms. That's where their, their ears are. They can listen for bats coming and they'll know not, not to jump. So anyway, cool cool stuff that you would only know uh, if you record from the, from the neurons themselves. All right. So I'm going to go back to our... Uh, our prep here, and I'm going to plug in. So this is our kit here. Um, we call this the Spiker Box, and it's a very simple uh, setup. And we have two pins. Um, one's a plus, and one's a minus. And I always ask students, why do we have a plus and minus? Because electricity is always referenced. So if somebody tells you a voltage, it is your duty, it's your, it's your God-given duty to ask compared to what, right? So, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the voltage uh, between one part of the leg where we think that there are neurons. Let's see if I can zoom a little bit more. Let's focus here. All right. No, not quite. There we go. And so we have one spot where we think that there are neurons, uh, which are right here by the leg uh, where these things are. And then a part up here in the coxa where we don't think the neurons are, so we're going to watch as the electricity passes from this part of the leg up to the brain, and we're going to be kind of a, an innocent bystander just watching what happens as the electricity goes by. So I'm going to just take one pin. It doesn't really matter where it's. So, for example, I'm going to stick it here in the, in the what's called the, the femur. I'll put this one in what's called the coxa. But... Uh, in some of our experiments, we ask the students to then move around, and they, they can learn what took me a while in, in grad school to figure out is referencing. So the closer you move the pins together, the less background noise you're going to get, uh, and then uh, the more single-unit activities you're going to find. So what we're going to do now in this experiment is I'm going to turn on the, uh, the spiker box, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to listen to 
what this recording sounds like. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this guy on. Just bring on the right side. So it sounds like a pass. I don't know if you guys can you guys hear this. So it sounds like it might be some noise or something like that. So what, so what experiments can we do? We ask the students. Uh, to, to sort of prove that these are actually neurons and not just some like kiss and glory. So what we can do is we can actually suck the hairs and see if we can see a change in the activity of them. Did you guys hear that? So each time I'm touching a hair, you're actually getting an increase in the activity. And what you're going to see is uh, that those spikes go faster that touch the hairs when they're not. So that's what's called rate coding. And that took a long time for neuroscientists to figure it out. But this is actually how the brain is so For example, if you hear someone talking to you, you have a neuron inside your cochlear that changes to the frequency. And the louder that they talk, the louder that frequency is, the more spikes that's going to get back to the brain. This is allowed to get music, allowed to get See with your eyes, the same thing, you get every rod, toe, close to a neuron. If there's no light in that area, you get none. If there's a lot of light, you get a lot of spikes. You get a small amount of spikes, you get less than light there. This is called rate coding. It's the rate of this neuron is coding with the, the amount of interceptors in this area. So, now we are careful scientists. Uh, we don't want to listen to it. You know, we want to be quantitative about it as well. So I'm going to show you here, uh, this is one of our apps. And right now, pick up my voice. And what I can do is I can turn off my voice and plug in uh, a, a speaker cable here. Now, okay, now it's no longer responding to my voice, but it's going to respond to whatever it's plugged in here. And I'm going to plug this into the budget box on this side. Uh, so now, I need to see what color to do this. I just think about this. I'm going to leave this camera out loud. I'm going to try to do both. So we are picking up a lot of feedback. I'm not sure if it's uh, the spiker box or someone else's phone. But if uh, if you're on, uh, if you're not muted, please feel free to mute your phone using star six if it's a landline, or mute if it's your cell phone. Um, so I can press record here, and 
I can uh, touch the spike. We can make a, a recording session on there. We can add event markers. And then what we can do is we can go back in and we can analyze those, those files and actually do some quanti quantification on it. So the first thing you may want to do is you may want to find out when did the spike the, the spike fire. So these are these are various questions you may have as a researcher. And then you can see, for example, the inner spike interval to make sure it's a real neuron. And then you can, so these are things that we discuss in our lesson plans that, that tell you exactly how the uh, how neuroscience has actually worked. And quantitatively, be able to measure these, these types of uh, the uh, I'll play back at the experiment I just did the touch of the leg, but I don't really have. Um, I did, so there's the neuron spike right there, which we we've now color coded them as red. So we now know the, the spiking rate at different times. So if you put if you control the amount of pressure that's on there, and you look at the spike rates in that paper I just shared you. That's one of the lab experiments that we can do. Is that if if your lab has a blower with a, like a, for air, if you have different PSI settings, you can set them up for different settings and be able to then go in and see and actually see that rate coding uh, actually occurring. You can write that down and quantitatively come up with a hypothesis and test that hypothesis uh, using some simple tools, and it turns out that it, it, it works really well. So it's a, it's a nice, that's a nice prep to do in the, in the, in the classroom. Any questions on, on that so far? I will say one more thing about this. And so we have, um, we used to only do it on our computers, and we thought that was super cool. And the student told us, I want that on my phone, you know, so we realized that we were not hip anymore. Uh, so, uh, but we have, we, have, we have since gone uh, the hip route. And we, uh, so all of our tools are mobile first, and that we actually do support, uh, you know, Windows, OS X, and even Linux, um, the Android platform, and Chromebooks. Uh, are becoming more popular, and obviously the iPads and iOS devices. So what we do on all these apps, we've been working hard to keep the quantitative side uh, level on all, on all those apps. So we'd be able to do not only just um, you know recording of, of, of the spikes, but actually doing event markers so that we can know exactly what time the, the stimulus came on, so that we can actually a answer some interesting questions about the about the spike responses. So that's. Really what neuroscientists do, electrophysiologists do in the lab, is that they record some spikes and they try to understand the relationship between the spikes and some behavior, or they did some stimulus in the lab as much they were All right, and so uh, what we've done is we've, we've um, published a number of papers. I didn't mention these, I could, uh, but they're in the PowerPoint slides that you'll get. Is that uh, we've published a number of, of peer-reviewed journal articles for teachers that have lesson plans at the end and, and some... Uh, uh, how to guides uh, on how to, how to basically do these experiments that I'm showing you right now. Uh, these are this is a, uh, an example of on, on, on D I'm showing you. This is the A, B, and C just showing you the spike spine. That's what you're listening to right now. But when I touch the leg, the barb of the leg, you can see an increase in the number of spikes for a second, and then it goes down. So this is if you're the brain and you're listening to the spike, you know when you're touched, and so therefore you know when to run away. Uh, some controls that you can do with students is to make sure that this is not just some logical noise that's coming from a fan in the room. Uh, you can put the entire spider box into a freezer and let the ions basically slow down again like we did the ice water. And all of a sudden all the neurons go away, take it back out again, they start to warm back up again and then the neurons come back. That's probably not electrical noise. Electrical noise doesn't act that way with a small change in temperature, right? So uh, we, can, we can pretty much convince uh, ourselves and students that this is a real phenomenon, that these are really act potential that you're seeing. And what's cool about it is that this is a, like a mobile device, so like these students just get their, I, I can't tell you how many times, these are, these are not doctor's photos, but like students are blown away when they get to see what their brain actually looks like. It's an exciting thing. It's like, uh, we, in the movie The Matrix, there's that code, you know, and like, oh my God, that's reality. Well, this is a moment where students realize what reality really is. Your brain is nothing but these, these, these green lines are going on inside of your spikes. So they have a hundred billion of them, but they're all doing the same thing, which is which is kind of cool. So uh, yeah, it's just some fun that we, we bring them on airplanes with us and, and get the stewardess to give us ice, and we could do experiments in the airplane. But uh, it's just a little bit of uh, fun. But this was a, a a movie I wanted to show you about another experiment that we just published. Uh, this is the one on grasshoppers, but I can't show you the video. Um, but I, I shared a link, and maybe we can share it out with you guys later. But I'll just tell you really quickly what it is. Uh, this, the question I want to 
answer is how fast do you have to move in order to catch a grasshopper? Uh, that's the driving question. And then what we can answer it is by understanding a little bit about the physiology of the grasshopper. So we know that inside the grasshopper, uh, there is a, an eye there, and that eye has to send a message down to the light to jump when something's coming close to it, right? And so what we can do now is we can sh uh, easily, I mean easily, without even, this is even less uh, invasive than the, than the cockroach, because we don't cut anything off. All we do is you can take down maybe the grasshopper uh, on its back and just place a wire right on its neck right there. So that's what I'm going to show you here. So I've got a take down the grasshopper. And this is 100% survivable surgery. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to pretend to throw a ball at the grasshopper. And we're going to know the speed of the ball because we're going to control that with the with our mobile devices. Uh, so we know the speed. And then we're going to look at when does that neuron fire down to the net, right? And so we can see if the neuron fires after we collided with you, that we caught you. If the neuron fires before it collided with you, then you escaped, right? You the grasshopper. So... Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a pretty fun experiment, and, and we do that all the time with students. And we have the grass, we have the students actually go catch the grasshoppers. They get a first-hand experience of what it's like to actually try to catch a grasshopper. They know intuitively how they caught the grasshopper, but now they're going to ask quantitatively, what did they do to do that? So uh, here's the setup. So this black dot comes towards the eye, and we know by controlling the the the, the, uh, the radius of this dot. We know the, the change in that radius. We know the, the change in velocity perception here, this angle of theta. So this is all built into the app, and so we just know the speed. That's really what, what we want to get at. So what we've shown is that, sure enough, that you can record, you can find the spikes that I showed you in, in, in our software, and then we know exactly the time of the collision because of what happens with the, uh, the, the iPhones controlling that. And then what we can do is and then look to see how fast you have to throw the ball in order to hit the grasshopper. And it turns out it's exactly between anywhere between minus four point meters per second. Uh, four meters per second is when uh, he was able to escape, but at six meters per second, he wasn't. So we caught it at six meters. So anyway, uh, and what's cool about this, this is, this is a prep that students, they intuitively get, uh, but... The secret is that this was a paper that was published in the highest journals of science less than a decade ago. This is from the this is a figure from the journal Science. This is the figure that comes out of our side. I should have scaled with the thing, but the point is that there's no excuse now for not being able to do top level science in K through 12 because we now have access to tools that allow us to do that. So you can tweak this a little bit, maybe change the angle of the ball. There's a lot of questions that a student can ask, and we have a number of them on our website of like. Question we don't even know the answer to, right? but I'd be curious to know. So we put them up there, and we allow uh, students to come up with their own project and do science research class projects to be able to answer these things. So hopefully uh, you guys are as excited about the potential of this as, as we are, as, as neuroscientists, being able to get real neuroscience tools. I mean real in the fact that it can publish in the journal Science, uh, AAA, that's the highest ranking journal science in the world. Uh, from the experiment that can be done in a classroom. I, I, I think that's super cool. So I'll just say it's a couple of quick things that are uh, from the engineering side, if you're into the engineering aspect of it, uh, we don't only just give away what our, uh, our components are and our schematics, but we tell you the reason why we chose particular values. Uh, so we go back to the, uh, the laws of nature, 1 over 2 pi RC for physics. Uh, as to why we particularly want a particular frequency to be cut off and not, and so then uh, if students want to look at something else, they'll look at a heartbeat or something else, maybe they'll change these values uh, and, and sort of look at something, some other type of biological signal. So this is uh, something that we're pretty proud of. This is um, another invertebrate, I didn't mention the earthworm, that's another paper we published. Uh, where we have a two-channel version. So this is our new our new kit that will be out in uh, uh, next month, and so we're going to put it in the Ward. We already have it sent over to the Ward Science Catalog. But this is a, a two-channel version of our of our kits that allow you to not only record a spike once but twice as it's passing by. So it's like put a two strips on the road. You can see when the car goes by how fast is it moving. So we do the same thing with electrical exponentials. We can measure the time that took the, the, the potential to travel from one point to the other, divide it by the distance that we know the, you know, the miles per hour, right? Um, it's the other way around. Distance divided by the time. So you 
miles per hour. So uh, we can measure that this, these spikes travel pretty quickly at 36 to 50 miles per hour, in, at least in the Earth law. Um, we, can, we can also do this experiment. Cockroach like the crickets and other things, but we like this one because it's really nice and long, and, it, uh, and you can actually really tease apart these, these things a little bit better. But anyway, um, I'm going to move on from this one. I'm going to skip over these experiments. I want to get into some of our, our newer stuff. Uh, but this is, I mentioned in the, in the mid-1700s, there was this idea of, of electricity. And I'll just briefly mention that, and I've shared another video with you as well to kind of go into the details of this. Um, but this is Luigi Galvani, uh, one of the first, neuro, the first neuroscientists in the world. Uh, and he discovered that if you hooked up frog legs to a uh, Van de Graaff generator, or here he's got a lightning rod, what he could do is he would watch that the frog legs would start moving again, even though it was perceived to be dead, right? So uh, he was the first to realize that muscles use electricity, uh, and the nervous system uses electricity. Uh, and so what we do in the classroom is we reproduce that, not using a lightning rod or a vinegar. We just use what the students have already. So we have uh, a little stimulator cable here that has two hooks on it that we hook out of the cockroach legs. And then we plug this one into the, uh, the student's cell phone, and then they can generate electricity themselves by understanding a little bit about how the magnet and, the, and their earbuds work. The current that goes down the magnet causes that magnet to move, which causes this uh, cone to vibrate. Uh, but in the, in the, the entire thing is based around electricity, right? If you take that electricity, cut off the earbuds, and put it directly to the cockroach leg, then we should be able to send that electricity to the cockroach leg. So that's exactly what we do. And then... I'm going to show you here what the results are. I'm not going to do the demo, uh, but it works really well. If you play hip-hop music, you can hear the music, in a, and they're going to notice about the phase frequency you get the light to kick, all right? Um, but on the high-frequency one, it doesn't kick. And so the question is, uh, why is it lower frequencies and higher frequencies? And you can go and draw out what the frequencies look like. And we know that you need a small amount of time for these ion channels to open and close. And so the higher the frequency the quicker they open and close, it doesn't give it enough time to charge. But low frequencies, the current will flow enough that these ion channels have a chance to open and cause the action potential. So uh, in this paper, that which we did with high school students, we noticed here that we have this sweet spot right around 100 hertz. And if you go and look at the top literature in the medical sciences to figure out where deep brain stimulation is, is set to, it's at 100 hertz. So here's an example, another example of students in a classroom being able to, to reproduce uh, experiments that have been done for like 25, 30 years on deep brain stimulation to figure out the, the precise frequencies to which you use electricity to stimulate neurons. So that's kind of cool. All right. Uh, the other video I share with you is just a fun one. This is uh, uh, someone else mentioned about invertebrates. These are squid. Um, and so we work with them. And uh, what I'm doing here in this video, which I won't show you because, but I'll, I'll have you Google it. It's super cool. We got on Science Friday today. And so that's the 
behavior of the animal. So what we can do is we can stick a wire inside the antenna uh, and then allow electricity to cause that neuron to fire, that neuron going back to the brain. And so we should be able to see the same behavior, the turning behavior of the antenna, uh, if we stimulate electricity versus if we did it naturally. And so that's what the experiments are. And so uh, what we've done is we made a little uh, connector to the top of the cockroach, and uh, the students, we all do, in that same paper we published that the antennas can re-go as well. Um, so we have the uh, ability to be able to connect to the um, uh, antennas directly, there's a wire that goes into the antenna, and then on the back side there's a, a 0 0.1 inch header, and then you can stick a backpack on there. And then of course what you want to do is you want to pair your backpack to your phone, so you can uh, have your robo uh circuit made. So this is a video which I can't show you, but you can Google this one. There's a bunch of uh, media about us taking our conferences out for a walk. Uh, so as you as you swipe your phone, what it's doing is sending a command to uh, the backpack to stimulate using that 100 hertz frequency into the brain to look the cockroach thinks you touch it something, it'll turn the other direction. So you can sit there and steer around your cockroach. So in our in our teaching tool version of the app, we don't set it to hundred. We let the students decide which one they can make it. Again, do some experiments. You're either making it random, and actually turning it down into a higher frequency, and seeing which ones work. And they'll come back with a, probably a similar solution that the uh, neuroscientists have done as well. All right. So now I want to just close out this by talking about our, our uh, human electrophysiology. Um, and maybe if I have time, some plant ultraphysiologists. We, we've been fortunate enough to give a number of uh, high-profile TED Talks, and we give another one this year on some plant stuff, and I'll talk about that at the very end. But right now, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the human physiology uh, and show you what we can do with that, because I think this stuff is pretty cool. So this is from our motor cortex now. What we're doing is we're going to be able to send the electricity uh, from the motor cortex across then that's the end of our spinal cord and coming out for our muscles, right? So uh, what we can do is we can record the electricity from those muscles to understand what the motor cortex is doing inside the human uh, mind. And so we have another version of our kit, which we call the muscle spiker box, which has the frequencies and, and the setup to allow us to do that uh, uh, exactly. So I'm going to then demonstrate by showing you how it works. So what we do is we have students put electrodes on their arms like this. All right, and like this. And then with this one, it's slightly different because of all the electricity in the room and having long leads, we have, it has a lot of electrical interference, which is actually a good thing to talk about. We can talk about you know, the fact that the electricity in the room is the same as electricity in our body, uh, so that they will be interfering with each other. It's a learning moment. And then what we can do here is we're going to show them that, uh, that if I record now from the output of my muscles, I can actually amplify what's happening. So I'm on this, on this hand, you may or may not know this, but our, 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 all of our systems cross over. Why? No one knows. All right. <laughs> it's one of the, there's a lot of bad theories out there why that is, but I, I don't know the answer to it. Um, and most people probably will tell you that they don't know either. So, but what we're going to do is we're going to show you what happens now. So I'm just turning on the uh, box here, so we're going to listen to as I beat my arm. So students are nuts for this. This is the first time they realize that there's a secret messages that are living inside their body. So we do the same thing we did on our other ones. We can uh, plug it into our, our iPad here. Get this right back on again. Measure the time between the hammer and the leg. It goes 
basically the spinal cord and back versus if I just touch your leg, it goes all into your brain and back. And it's from 30 milliseconds up into about 130 milliseconds. It's kind of cool. It's 100 milliseconds forward, you go up to the brain. So you can actually make these quanti quantified uh, measurements in the classroom, which is kind of exciting. So that's one thing. And then what I'm going to show you now is something else you can do. So this is our our spider box, and we use this one for doing quanti quantitative experiments in the classroom. But if you have a, a different angle, if, you, if you're more about the engineering side, we hear you, dog. We know what you like. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you now how to do uh, our, our Duino. So this is um, the same box, but now we've made it in a form factor that fits on top of the Arduino. Um, let's see if I can show you. This is what I, I'll leave on. I'll leave on this one here. This um, so what I'm going to show you now is the Arduino, which is going to be able to make a little small manual. We'll jump ahead. Sorry. Let's all over the So we want to be able to do a brain machine interface. Is what we're getting at. So we want to be able to take the output of the brain and feed it into a computer so that we can do various things with that. So uh, to do that, we're going to use the Arduino. If you're not familiar with what those are, they're just mini computers. Uh, and they do a very simple task. So here's an example of this microcontroller here that uh, wants to feed this angry cat, but every time the cat puts his paw on the sensor, he kicks out of food, right? And so therefore, the cat would not be happy. But the idea is that you don't want to use your Intel Pentium PC to drive this, this computer that's going to be doing nothing most of the time, and then once in a while be able to do something. So what they've done, they being the, the engineers, is come up with a very, what's called an embedded microprocessor. It's a very simple machine that you program to do very simple things, right? So uh, in the case of the Arduino, what we're going to do is we're going to amplify the signal into this machine, and then we're going to turn on a roll of lights. That's the, that's the kind of the hello world of physical computing. So um, we're going to do that by, by sort of making a, a version of the, uh, of the spiker box that will digitize the signal and feed it into the microcontroller, and it does that very simply. So I'm going to slide the microcontroller, let's see, I'm going to put the battery in the microcontroller, and you can see here's our amplifier. We've merged these two together. Now my muscles, instead of going to a speaker, are being controlled using these lights. So this is, this technically is a brain machine. It's not very exciting seeing like a bunch of uh, lights come out, but you can get an idea for the amount of pressure I'm getting there. But this is uh, something in the physical world that a student can do to understand about basically how, how the brain works. And so uh, what we want to do now is I want to show you how you can do that to make it a little bit more interesting. So we can take something like a robotic claw here and actually we can get it to do some work. So I'm going to show you here how I'm going to pair this claw uh, to the computer here. So now when, when I close my hand, so now the students are starting to think about what they can actually do with this, right? So this is, this you can just do real, some real work. You have students like pick things up and understand like uh, uh, how to control things. And they'll, they'll learn pretty quickly that it's, it's actually hard to keep your muscles stretched to be open. So our muscles actually don't do that. We have an off section. So we move in one direction, gravity keeps it there, and we move in the other direction. So it's, except for the exerting forces up there. But, so this is kind of an interesting uh, experiment that can be done just on, on this prep right here of, of understanding how to control machines from your brain. And then the, the next thing we can do is we can look at micro-simulation again. And I'm not going to demo it. I don't have person here. But uh, one of our TED Talks that we gave, uh, not at this TED, but the, the one before that, we have a made up online. Um, it's what's called the human-to-human -human interface. And what we can do is we can take the EMG signal, which you saw on here, uh, I can show it to you uh, so you can do is take so we can take this thing the machine here and feed it into another student so that while I'm moving my arm here, the other students you can feed that EMG into the, into their own or nerve and all of a sudden their hand will move as well. So you have one person can take another hand. So that the human to human interface. Uh, and that's a huge hit. That's a, it's a, it's a fun. It just uses a, a TENS device that we've modified to be able to, to send it in the EMG that we have from, from the other the other system. But, uh, from, the, from the EMG, from the re recording person, we sent it to the owner nerve of the receiving person, and that has this cool effect of being able to control the other person. And you're really supposed to make it blind them. Then the question is, uh, what happens, for example, if you take the person who 
were recording from, and then another person moved his arm, right? Move her arm. And so, if you do it, the other person won't move. They'll be, so this one will move and the other one won't. The other question you can ask is, if I keep this arm still, but they still try to press it, will the other hand move, right? So this is, uh, this is called isometric contractions. It turns out that it doesn't matter. If there's a lot of things in the brain down the spinal cord and you record it, it doesn't matter if your hand physically moves. You can actually get the other hand to it. So those are some fun experiments you can do with that one. And that, uh, believe me, there's not going to be a board kid in that class. We <laughs> can do that one. Uh, we've had that going for almost three years now. That's still our, our, our go-to demo. I will tell you one more thing that we're, I'm going to uh, end with, and then I'll open up the floor for questions, and that is, we have some new experiments that we're, uh, we're proud to announce. I think when I was at NSTA last year, uh, we, we presented with wards. We didn't quite have this yet. We, we're kind of working at it. But now I'm proud to say that on October 10th, that TED Talk's going to come out, and we have uh, kits here to support it. Um, and we're going to be able to record in the brains of plants. Uh, so plants don't have brains, but they do have uh, action potentials. And they do have action potentials for the same reason that we have brains. They want to move. They want to move quickly. And so I'm going to show you uh, really quickly some cool behaviors. You know, here's the thing. Okay. 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 Oh, I just, I just did it. All right. Oh, well. Maybe I can show you this one. I'm going to switch over to this camera. So with Venus fly traps and with sensitive hypnosis, these are plants that you can get from, from your local plant stores um, or on the Internet. So this is the sensitive hypnosis. If you're not familiar with this guy, what you can do is you can do these cool behaviors. If you touch the leaves, I don't know if you noticed that. See what's happening with those leaves? So I touched it, and all of a sudden the leaves start to close up. Um, and so it turns out that inside this plant, I'm going to do another one over here. Oh, oh, there's another behavior. So I was going to show you that one second. So the other one is the leaves will play dead. So if I touch them hard enough, they'll fall down. Uh, so here's another one here. I'm going to touch it. You see how it falls down? How is that possible? You know, it's, it's kind of weird. And so uh, with the same tools I'm showing you right now, we can answer that question. And so the uh, in the mimosa, on the back side, there's a touch receptor on there, which is literally the same touch receptor that's in the human body. Uh, so that it's been highly conserved across, uh, you know, not just mammals or even vertebrates, even the plant kingdom. Uh, so we had these touch receptors a long time ago. That same touch receptor sends an electrical current uh, all the way down that leaf, which is causing water to rush out of those cells, which causes them to change their shapes. And when it gets to the very end of that stalk, it makes all the water come out of that one and the entire branch will fall. So depending on how much you touch it, if you touch it a little bit, you just get the leaves to close. If you whack it, then you get the, the branch to fall. Why does it do that? We don't understand the science. We think that it's trying to be less appealing to herbivores or maybe to scare away insects. But how it does that, we actually know really well how it works. And the other question is with the Venus flytrap. So how do Venus flytraps know when to close when the fly is there? That's an interesting question. So uh, with our kit, you're able to put an electrode around the back of the plant, uh, and you tuck the inside of here, and you'll see an action. But it won't close. It will wait until if it gets a second action potential within 20 seconds, it starts to count, right, almost. And so what you do these experiments, you can have a student that touch it every, you know, every, 50, every 50 seconds, and you can touch that all you want. You can be a fly landing on there. As long as the fly is not moving around inside of there, it's not going to close. And we go into a bunch of reasons why that's the case. You know, it takes a while for these things. It takes a lot of energy to bring it to open back up. They don't need to eat that many flies. You know, they only open up a number of times that the plant will die. Uh, so it's really important for this plant to have evolved to be able to sense because there's really a deal inside of it. So these are cool things. And we have uh, some other new ones that we're going to be coming out with, with uh, uh, telegraph plants, plants that move uh, by themselves. We're going to be able to, I, and actually, that's unknown to science. It's even a cool project for students uh, to record for them to understand those cyclical cycles that are going out of it. Uh, how is that mediated? So uh, anyway, I'm going to end it there. And I hope it was... Uh, educational and somewhat maybe you know, entertaining uh, in some ways. Uh, we get that we get that uh, response often from, from uh, students and from teachers. But uh, there's a lot a lot of information here. Each one of these projects, uh, I even go into some of our other stuff. We have uh, EKGs we can record from EEGs from the brain. Um, we have so much more that we.
we have time for in this, in this uh, introductory session. But I'm hoping that you're interested enough that uh, we can work with you in the future to be able to kind of push this neural revolution forward and sort of introducing uh, advanced neuroscience uh, into the classroom in such a way that, uh, that we can make this a success across the country. So thank you for your time, and I'll open up the, uh, the chat room, I guess, uh, for more questions. Or unmute yourself if you'd like. Hi, Greg. Are there any citizen science projects that any of your experiments might be applied to? Yeah, so we, 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 we don't have a really good model for citizen science. This is, uh, citizen science are good for big data problems, right? Uh, so we don't quite have that yet. We are in the, in the process of that. Um, but I, I can't quite know. I have this sign right here. We have a songbird project, which we're working on, which is a, which is a really good citizen science project. For, uh, we call this more of an amateur science. These are people asking individual questions that they can collect the data from. Uh, so that is citizen science, but when people tend to talk about that, they tend to talk about where large groups of people will analyze a large data set or try to collect a large data set. And I think for our experiments, um, what we're looking at is a phenomenon, a small phenomenon that a, a, an individual, an amateur, a citizen, could do the science and be able to, to answer those questions, but it's not in the traditional way uh, that, that it's a... Uh, that it's... Hi, Greg. Hello. Uh, my name is Filberto Vicente. I'm from um, Diné College. Um, we're out from the west, uh, southwest, and I'm from a college, like, like I said, Diné College, and um, I'm a STEM coordinator here, and I found that the WARD's uh, online resources were very helpful and found that um, some of the kits that they have is very interesting. And right now I'm working on bringing in those type of kits for our upcoming STEM festival. And would you, I wanted to ask you if you would be interested in, in um, creating a partnership or either um, participating in our STEM festival. Sure. Uh, so we, we're, we're actually starting to, one of the, the plans that we, we have for this year, which is running out, um, <laughs> is to cr create this type of community event. So like the, the idea that uh, there, are, there are festivals around, like, like yours, that, that we have uh, requests for to, go, to give talks to. But we also have a, a, a number of, of neuroscience. So I'm still a practicing neuroscience. I still have my card. Uh, and we have a number of colleagues that are around there that, that uh, are probably local that we're trying to coordinate with to, to be able to match this up. So what we're, we have a new process in place uh, that we're starting next week uh, to actually build this community together. So what I'm going to actually do is send me an email. Then we can use this as a pilot project to see if this were the case, how would we do it, and we'll actually uh, try to connect you. And so uh, that's something that works because I think the feedback we've received from some teachers is that um, we need better lesson plans, and that's what we've been working. We've got a, a large NIH grant uh, to, to build that out, and so we've been uh, in, in improving our lesson plans uh, and in creating an actual textbook uh, that will come along with this project-based learning uh, plan that we're, that we're building up. The other one was to get people like us to come into this classroom. Um, and I think it's because there's not a quite there's not that comfort level uh, of dealing with neuroscience if you're if you're a teacher or even at the, at the university level. Uh, there's not there's not something you're expert in. Uh, and we try to make our tools available to everyone so that you become the expert. But I can understand why that's not the case. And so we're trying to come up with a way to support you. So to do that, we're going to build this, this idea of a community that we can connect you with people that are in the area that, that are going to be willing to enable to come out there. I can't do it. I wish I, I, I go out and get too many talks as it is. My, my wife and young family get mad at me. <laughs> so well, what, what I'd like to do is get, get someone who knows our, our stuff um, and, and can come in and do these types of festivals for you. So that, that's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an excellent question. Okay. Um, while I do have connections with some of our science faculties here with the college, um, if you could uh, send me, or if you could give me your email address, I can I'm, try to connect yeah. you with, the, with one yeah, of the correct. faculty. I'm, I'm uh, Greg at BackyardBrains.com. So that, that's me. And then uh, 
Yes, yeah, so we have. We, uh, I'm still a professor at the university. So I, I have a group of students that, uh, in the School of Information, doing a UX pro project, and I gave them literally this task to figure out what the, the process to both bring on, recruit, recruit like uh, neuroscience experts from the, from graduate programs and, and from colleges, and connect them to teachers and to uh, to kind of outreach programs. Uh, so, yeah, the. I'm aware of that issue, and we are working on it. We will Sounds be good. Thank you. All right, thank you. And so if you want to follow up, we have, uh, so what we have every summer, we do a neuroscience fellowship uh, where we bring on uh, students uh, that will develop new experiments for the next generation of students. Right, so like this year, we worked with electric fish, we worked with dragonflies, we mentioned those. Uh, we worked with fruit flies. Uh, we worked with uh, squid and octopus. Um, and we were, in each one of those, we were doing an experiment that uses some of our tools to answer some questions about the brain. And a lot of these questions are unknown to science. So what I like, uh, what I like to do in these, in these summer programs is sort of eat our own dog food, in a sense, and sort of show you how you can actually answer real scientific questions just using the kind of cheap DIY tools. And so we're going to continue to do that. It's actually the most fun we've ever, uh, that's my favorite part of the year, is, is those uh, two and a half months of the summer we get to do this research. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to be, uh, when we make an announcement, if you can, uh, maybe I'll send out the awards and maybe send out to you, but the, uh, is to let your students know about that. Uh, we're, we always look for, for uh, you know, good people uh, for doing the summer. Uh, and also follow up, because you, you may learn, uh, we, we make our students write up every step of the process of like some of the experiment, what worked, what didn't work, how did you change the experiment. So, like, a lot of the stuff that happens in science is, that doesn't get talked about, at least in the academic, what you see at the end is the, is the finished product, right, uh, in, the, in the publication. And so we don't quite see all the dirty work that goes on, but we like to expose that on our blog. And so we, we have the students every two weeks write about all the things that worked and what didn't work and why you changed things in a certain way. And so and sometimes the entire project should shift focus. We had one student working on a, a pygmy squid that moved through an octopus for, for various reasons. So uh, they can be dramatic changes and they can be slight changes to the to the continual you know, idea of it. But anyway, so that's what we, uh, we are legitimately focused on making this a reality. So I love the fact that you guys took some time out of your day to learn about us. Um, and hopefully we can get some of our kids and, and we can chat with you some more. Hi, Greg, we have a question. How competitive is your summer internship and how can students apply? We have put a, a call for applications out in um, it's February. Uh, and then we don't ask, we don't ask uh, GPA, oh, we may add that um, back in. We, the things we look for are not quite the things that most universities look for because we found if uh, we actually brought in students from uh, a major you know, like Harvard and, and they haven't worked out that well because what we look for are people that can take risks and typically if you made it into some Ivy League school, you didn't take many risks in life. <laughs> That's what I so I think the, to be a good, to be a clever researcher and do the stuff we're trying to do, which is kind of the uh, kind of the low-fi neuroscience. You have to have a different mindset, different outlook. And so we ask, uh, you'll see the application box. Yeah, we publish them up there. Uh, the questions we asked years past, but we try to get at more about you as a person, you as a kind of a creative soul. How well do you work in, without uh, complete information? These are all questions that are really helpful for scientists. Um, and we found that they successful uh, teams of ours, and actually. We have a pretty cool, we haven't written a grant yet, but some of the things you want to do is write a grant to actually support this and actually make it a little bit more, uh, more Hollywood than it is. But, um, we have a really cool track record. We have a number of our students uh, that are in graduate school now. We have uh, former students that have graduated with uh, PhDs from Harvard. Uh, so, uh, we have a, a higher track record of people going into graduate programs than the average uh, school or probably average institution. Uh, so, uh, we like to train our students as if they're graduate school students, and then we have them be assigned them a uh, project that they have, then the project becomes theirs, and they have to figure out the questions to ask, and, uh, and, and are responsible, and they take responsibility for their craft and for getting it through. So, uh, anyway, it, it's, I can't say enough fun things about it. Actually, this year, we turned it 
to a TV show that will be airing sometime this fall. Uh, each of these students was an episode, um, and we filmed that with, with Ted, and the and we, uh, the, the working title is called WTF Brain, and it's going to be, uh, I'm not sure where it's going to come but it's going to be fun. We're going to look at all these different animals and ask, answer some questions about evolution, and answer some questions about the uh, about spiking of the around, uh, and uh, but they're all getting at some aspect of the brain uh, in different ways, and, and we choose the imperative animal based upon the question we want to ask. Um, <coughs> and I should say, <coughs> invertebrates, because <coughs> we have a number of uh, human uh, projects as well. We have one recording for the brain when someone's sleeping, and we're asking questions about, can you, can you insert memories into the brain while you It turns out you can. Um, we read that in the journal of science, we reproduced it in, the, in our lab, that we showed it on camera, and sure enough, that you can actually, when someone's sleeping, you can play back tones, and they will remember that better than things that they didn't hear. It's kind of cool. Anyway, uh, we have other ones based upon decoding. Can you can you decode what the human is looking at uh, if you flash pictures? It turns out you can do that as well. Uh, not not that great, but you can do there is information there. That's kind of cool. So yeah, I can't say enough cool things about it. And it, it was cool enough that we we got a, a eight episodes of the TV show out of it, which is, which is pretty cool. We have another question. Has there been any data sharing collaborations to study any variants in the neural psychology yeah, psychology yeah, across this, environments? This is the citizen science question that we have not tackled yet. Uh, we do share our data set. So, for example, if you uh, if you go to that grasshopper uh, study uh, in our in our papers, we we published not just the figures uh, as a source of the figures. We actually published literally the entire database of spikes that we recorded. So the idea was that if we if we release our data set, then as people can come back in, then we can start to collect these things together. But we haven't figured out the technology yet or the platform where we can share those things together. And, and that gets at the like the variance that occurs across different species, you know, within species. Uh, citizen science question that we could ask for everyone place your lecture at this, you know, these locations and let's let's record this and try to answer this question. But I'm not quite sure what that what that question is yet. So the as you may or may not know, the hardest part of, of science is knowing the question to ask, not quite collect the data, right? So it's the I'm trying to figure out if we have that, what could we answer that we don't know already? So um because within, within perhaps one of the variables, but that is something I've been thinking about. I'm struggling to figure that out. So uh, it is a, it is on our radar. Folks, last call for any other questions for um, uh, for Greg from Backyard Brains. Don't forget, you can unmute your phone by hitting star six if you're a landline the normal mute button on your phone, or you can type them through the web chat feature. All right, Greg, thanks so much for joining us today. We loved having you. We loved our uh, the presentation. Uh, Peter, through the Ward Science chat, did share the link for the spiker box uh, and for the muscle, uh, the okay. muscle spiker shield as well. So those are out there. Um, for everybody if they want to pull that out of the chat and take a look. We also shared the link that you mentioned earlier for, uh, what was it, the uh, the octopus, right? Was it the octopus? No, the squid? Oh, the squid prep, yeah, yeah. The insane in the chromatophore, so we did share that through the chat as well if anybody wanted to pull that and, uh, and watch that as well. Excellent. All right, well, enjoy. I hope it, hope it was uh, not too boring. Uh, <laughs> All right, thank you, guys. And uh, uh, I hope to hear from you soon with some cool ideas. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.